So when making my gingerbread houses, I first had to come up with the idea and the theme. This theme that I'm, I've come up with is for um, the town in which I grew in, which is a lot of holiday memories. So I grabbed each key component building that I find very important to me. And then in order to create that, I need to turn gingerbread to me as a cookie. So I need to make the cookie cutters for that. And we call them templates. So these templates that I've created, I've created every one of these structures that I'm gonna be doing out of cardboard. So I take um, the image and then I transfer it into um, geometrics and measurements, and then I cut it into cardboard. This is what we're gonna end up doing. Um, so I have it laid out here in template form. So we're gonna first, um, the candy store, it's gonna be here, it's gonna be um, yellow siding and then green fondant poured sugar windows flooded with a uh, brick popping out of the plaster. This is going to be all, this is the smokehouse. This is going to be all wood grain and all gingerbread and then brushed to make it look like it's smoke. To make this wood grain effect that we're going to be using, all I do is take my gingerbread and just score back and forth and it creates this wood grain effect. And then after it bakes, it ends up looking like that. This is the church. This is going to be all um, fondant stones um, and then uh, poured stained glass windows. To make the stones, what I do is I take some white fondant and some black fondant. And all I do is I just work this together and just keep working it until I get that marbling effect that I'm looking for. And I try not to over mix it. We end up with something like that. Then I just take a piece off and I individually roll. And I just make random little stones. To do the facade of the church, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just going to put some raw icing down. Like so. And I'm just gonna take my finger, I'm just gonna spread this out. Cause I'm gonna then embed all of, all of the stones in this. Over here is the farmer's market and this is going to be gingerbread with fondant accents. This one is going to be pretzel and this is going to be um, uh, fondant bricks um, and then a little stone base at the bottom. Uh, in the center, that's going to have the sign and since it's Lebanon and known for the cedar trees, I'm gonna have little evergreens in that. When I make my gingerbread, um, a little different recipe that I have is I actually take my honey and my high ratio shortening and I boil that together and then I also add my sugar. And that gets all boiled together and that's going to give me my snap and my crispness that I need. This I will then dissolve all the granules in this sugar and then it will be a smooth syrup. From here I need to cool it down. I can do it two ways. I can either put it in the freezer to cool it down quickly or in the refrigerator. Um, but I just want to cool it down. I don't have to have it cold. So now my honey, sugar and uh, fat mixture has cooled enough that I can add it to my dry ingredients. And I have here my spices, my baking powder, and then my bread flour. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the machine on. Make sure I'm on first speed. And then I'm gonna slowly pour in the syrup. I'm gonna mix this until it forms a paste. And then at that time, I'm gonna add my eggs and a little bit of water to finish it out. So here's my finished uh, gingerbread dough. And then after that, I'm gonna transfer it onto my sheet pans and then it'll get cool. And as you can see, it gets fairly firm then.
special holiday edition of ACF Chefs Forum. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to have experts here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships. And on behalf of our partners at Massachusetts and New Hampshire ProStart, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's very special presentation on gingerbread skills. The holiday season can be big business for bakeries, pastry shops, hotels, restaurants, caterers, and pastry chefs and clubs. So today we hope that you will be inspired to take your gingerbread skills to the next level. We wanna hear from you. So today we'll be taking questions for our featured chef live during the webinar and chef is very interested in hearing your questions. So please be sure to use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs and culinary students who are tuning in and the Q&A function to pose questions to today's featured chef. Okay, so let's get that conversation going in the chat. Please let us know where you're tuning in from today if you haven't already. And now I'll pass the mic to Amy to let us know a little bit more about our special guest chef and what we're in store for with today's presentation. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jackie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Amy Pariso, and I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association Education Foundation. We are so pleased to welcome today's featured culinarian who is here today to inspire you. He is not only a great chef, but a true artist. Chef Brian Pepley, CEPC, CCE, and AAC, is the pastry art chef at the Lebanon County Career and Technology Center in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. He brings over 30 years of experience to the program, having previously worked as an executive chef at the Hotel Hershey in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Chef Puffley has served on the board of directors for the central chapter of the Pennsylvania Restaurant Association Education Committee and the Pastry Advisory Board for Pennsylvania College of Technology. He is an active ACF member and past chapter president of the ACF Harrisburg chapter. His students are also Skills USA champion medalists at both the state and national level. Chef has received many awards and received an ACF Presidential Medallion in 2010 and has been inducted into the ACF's Honor Society, the American Academy of Chefs. Chef's Pro Start program was also the first secondary post pastry arts program in the country to receive ACF accreditation and LCCTC has also been recognized as an exemplary program. Chef, thank you so much for joining us today. I know our New Hampshire students are super excited. And at this time, we'll pass the presentation over to you. Well, thank you so much. Happy holidays, everybody. On behalf of the ACF and PRLA and also ProStart, I thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. Today, I have with me Chef Robert Coral, who's a culinary arts instructor. He's gonna be my cameraman for the day. So let's not wait any longer. Let's get started. So today we're gonna to go ahead and look at the recipe for gingerbread, how gingerbread's made. Um, originally, I have sent the recipe to you, so you have that. So let's talk about that. I'm gonna start with sugar. I'm gonna start with honey and sweetex. Sweetex is a high ratio of shortening. We wanna boil that first. So one of the tips I would see So what you want to do is put the sweet sweetex down first, melt that, add your honey, and then put your sugar on top. The key then is you want to bring that up to a boil. Why you want to bring that to a boil is it's going to create that snap when it goes to bake the gingerbread dough. Then you're going to take your bread flour, your ground cinnamon, your ground ginger, and your baking powder, and that's going to go in the mixing bowl. The hot liquid um, butter sugar mixture our fat mixture, you're gonna put that in the refrigerator and chill that slightly. You wanna take some of the heat off of that. Then that's gonna be poured in on top of that dough and then that's gonna be used with a paddle and you're gonna mix that into a paste. Then we're gonna finish it off with some eggs and some water. So when we're finished, we're gonna end up with a consistency that's pretty pliable. So we wanna go ahead and take some of this out here and show you what that looks like. And it's gonna be tender. It should have a nice tender appearance to it. So it's gonna be nice and pliable. So let's talk about rolling out the dough. First things first is in storing this is all you want to do is you want to just take the dough, put it on a floured sheet pan. I recommend one that's fiberglass and not the metal one because the metal one has a tendency to pick up that metal um, hue to the dough. So you don't want that. So if you don't have a 
uh, fiberglass sheet pen, you can use parchment paper. And then what I also recommend is we want to also talk about casting. You know, flour is a, a lovely medium when you're rolling out dough, but you want to make sure that you use product and you end up with streaks on your dough and not enough and ends up sticking to the table. So we want to try to avoid those things. You know, using a basic rolling pin, making sure you flour your pin very well. And then you want to make sure you go ahead and roll it out to a consistency. So I already have some pre-rolled out. And I'm very fortunate. I just this year got a dough sheeter. So if any of you out there that have dough sheeters, you know how wonderful they are to have. So I have a dough sheeter and I roll these out. And people always ask me, should I use a silk pad or should I use parchment? If you use a silk pad, you won't end up with what you see here, this wrinkling effect that's happening. So if you use a silk pad, it'll give you a nice smooth base to it. So here I have the dough already rolled out. And if you notice, I have it about a quarter to an eight inch thick. And it's really important that you roll it out evenly because when it bakes, if you have one side a little thicker and one side a little thinner, one will be crisp and one will be still doughy. So we wanna make sure we take care of that. So let's talk about once we make the dough, I like to let my dough sit out at room temperature. I know it has eggs in it, but realize what we're making here is show work. So it's not to be consumed. While it is an edible dough, it's not made to be eaten. It's, it's really designed for show because when it bakes, it becomes really brittle and really hard. And that's what we want when we're constructing something that's going vertical. So the next thing I wanna talk about is, I wanna talk about templates, okay? Gingerbread is really cookie. And in order to make a cookie, you usually need a cookie cutter. So what you have to do is you have to create your templates. So what I like to use, I like to use cake board boxes, not the corrugated. The corrugated has that weave and it gives you a very uneven edge to it. Where if you use a cake box, you have this nice template that you can follow. I can't emphasize the importance of having an accurate template as well as being able to transfer that onto the dough. So what I recommend is when you're cutting out your pieces, I like to roll out my dough roll it up onto the pin and then onto the sheet pan. And I cut my dough on the sheet pan. That way I don't have to transfer it onto another medium onto the sheet pan, which could possibly distort those pieces. And any distortion that you have in those pieces make it much more difficult when you go to put it together. Okay, does that make sense? All right, let's keep going on. So let's talk about different techniques that you can use to emboss or enhance the texture of gingerbread. So when gingerbread bakes, it has this beautiful um, color to it. And I always recommend that you wanna bake it to a dark golden brown. So that dark golden brown will give you that stiffness that you need. Also, you wanna make sure when you're baking pieces off, make sure they're all about the same size. So if you have some smaller pieces, let's say some shutters, which I have over here, we wouldn't want to bake this and this off on the same sheet pan because what's going to happen is these are going to get too dark before this gets completely baked. It's no different than when we're baking in the real world with cookies and things like that. We want to make sure the same size product is on the same sheet pan. All right. So let's talk about embossing. The same type of tools that you use for fondant, you can use in turn on gingerbread dough. So the first thing I want to show you is I want to show you a technique of if you don't have anything like this, I'm gonna show you what you can do with just a simple pizza wheel or pastry wheel. So if I take the dough and if I just take my wheel and I just score back and I'm not cutting through the dough, but I'm going to create a wood grain effect. And just by rocking back and forth and giving a nice little impression in the dough, again, not cutting all the way through, but just letting my wheel create these grains might end up looking after it bakes, it ends up looking like this. So if I'm doing some type of a rustic mill or an old barn, this is kind of the technique that I'm looking for. So I can give this a nice little rustic look and appearance. Or a Lebanon smokehouse. Or a Lebanon smokehouse, mm -hmm. thanks Bob, that's right. So this gives you a really great wood grain texture, all right? So I would cut my template out, then I would score it, and then I would bake it, and this would give me that nice wood grain effect. So. If I have a grooved rolling pin, I can get this nice grooved appearance. And I like this appearance, especially if I'm doing a porch or a roof. This gives you the grain of looking like it's more consistent, like a floor on a board on a porch, right? So we have that. Then the last thing I did was is I took my fondant embossing tool 
and you get this beautiful ivy impression. Now, this same type of tools you can use for doing bricks, doing um, any type of silicone mat that you have that you can embed or impress press onto the dough, you're going to get that image and it gives you this beautiful, um, really pretty look. Um, and if you don't want to do a gingerbread, this would be a really pretty display piece as well. All right. So that covers a little bit about that. Again, when you're baking, make sure you have good flat sheet pans because any imperfection in that sheet pan is going to pick it off, um, pick up on that dough. And then again, it's going to make it more difficult for you to put it together. Right. So that takes care of baking. We have a little bit of understanding of baking. Now I want to show you doing windows. A lot of questions of people. You can certainly take your dough. And if you want, you can just pipe your windows on. You can certainly do it that way. You can cut out fondant and you can apply it on top and then embellish it that way. But to give a more realistic look, you really should cut the windows out of the dough. So this is a piece that we're going to show at the end of the presentation, but this is a sidewall and this shows you your windows, right? So here's the back side, all right? And you can see how nice and smooth it gets. All right. And if you made your dough correctly, you've had this beautiful, nice, smooth appearance, all right? Now, different techniques that you can use. First one is you cut out your windows and you bake the dough. You can then take. This is a gelatin sheet. So if you're in pastry arts, you're familiar with this. Maybe culinary students, you haven't seen something like this. This is something in a gelatin form, but it's in sheets. And these you can put in, in the backside and it gives you the illusion of glass, but it's actually edible. And that's one thing I wanna talk about. I don't use in any of my um, presentations or any of my houses, I don't use any styrofoam, cardboard, plastic. Um, and the reason why is a lot of my houses, I like to try to compete with them. And most of the judges want everything edible. So I try to stay away from everything like that. All my houses, if I need superstructure, what I mean by that is if I have a long spanning roof, I might cut an extra piece or two to go inside to hold that roof up. So getting back to the windows, I have this. I can take fondant that I rolled out and got hard. I can put that in the back. I can use them both together and I can create the illusion of a window and a light coming from it. So take it and I can wrap my fondant in um, my gingerbread and fondant and then put the um, fondant on the back side like I have here. So that gives the illusion that there's light emanating from it. So let's talk about if you want to do poured sugar. So if you do poured sugar, uh, Susan Nodder taught me a little trick. Is when you're pouring your poured sugar out, you can use any recipe for a poured sugar. You want to definitely use a recipe and get the right ratio. But when you're pouring your sugar out and you get it to the right consistency, you want it up to that hard crack stage using the candy thermometer and you pour it out. So I have two different illusions here. One is frosted. And while the sugar was still wet, I put some sugar on it, some granulated to give it a frosted appearance. But then this one here, I poured out. And Susan always told me that if you have bubbles, if you take a torch and while it's still hot, lightly brush it with the heat of the torch and the flame, the bubbles disappear and they all pop out. So you don't have to take a toothpick and pop those little bubbles up. Just take the torch and go over it very carefully. But you got to be careful that you don't hit the, hit, the, hit the gingerbread because it will scorch that. All right. So that gives you that illusion there. And then last but not least, um, this is one I learned when I was in elementary school. You can take hard candy. You can take, uh, these are butterscotch. You can take uh, Jolly Ranchers, you can take candy cane, any hard uh, candy, you can grind it up. And then this is done before baking. So you would take the dough while it's raw, cut out the windows, and then you would sprinkle this candy into the window. And then this would give you this illusion and it would melt as it's baking and fuses them together. So that gives you another look. So you can do fondant and gingerbread, you can do poured sugar windows, you can do it with icing. So there's many, many different techniques that you can use. Yeah, chef, if you want to talk to them about maybe the area of the country that they live in uh, uh, with humidity. Yeah, good point. One of the things is we're in Pennsylvania and um, right now the humidity is dropping. So we're able to get away with doing poured sugars. But for you Florida folks, um, it's very difficult to do sugar windows um, to last for a long period of time. It probably only last up to a couple of days. So what I like to do is I like to build my houses to last because I use them as recruitment. I told you I use them to compete. 
And um, right now it's recruiting stage at our school. So there's a lot of students coming through. So I like the house if I'm gonna spend, you know, upwards of a hundred hours on that. So that's the thing I really need to talk to you about is, and that's the next thing is the five P's. And I'm sure you've heard this prior planning prevents poor performance. Well, one of the things that we always talk about is, is you're going to have to take time and plan this out. So people always ask me, where do I come up with the ideas? I always do original ideas or I do um, historical properties in my community. I've done many things that you've seen in, in the videos um, of the houses that I've done. And it's people, things that I want to show focus to. So if I'm looking on the internet, I might pull a turret from this house and a porch from that house or a tower or a porch or an eave. Um, so we're talking architecture. So I might pull different concepts and then come up with my own original idea. And then I transfer that all back into, into my template. And that's how I come up with my ideas. Just like all the really good competitors out there, um, they, they come up with an idea and there's a lot of planning that goes behind it. So we really wanna focus on the concept of, of coming up with an idea and then following that idea all the way through. And it comes from planning. So let's talk about some of the different techniques and things like that. Well, to glue this all together, we need royal icing. Um, I've seen a lot of people use the wrong icing. So the biggest thing that you wanna do is you wanna use royal icing. Royal icing, no more than tannic sugar, confectionery sugar, and egg whites. And when it dries, it becomes concrete. For those that have used it, um, and if you don't clean up after yourself, it's almost like concrete that you have to chisel off the board or the table to get through that kind of stuff. So we wanna make sure that we talk about the royal icing and then we wanna talk about proper consistency. So I have here for you to show you, the first thing I wanna talk about is when you're doing, working with royal icing, you wanna make sure that you keep it covered. And I always put a wet paper towel on it along with the saran wrap. And the reason why is, is as soon as this is exposed to the air, it's going to. When you're working with this, you want to make sure that you keep it covered at all times. So I want to talk about consistency. So we don't just make the royal icing and then we use it. It depends on what we're using it for. If I'm going to be attaching things, I want probably a semi stiff icing. I don't want it too thin. Now. For those that have done like, let's say flooding sugar cookies and things like that, well, then you need a thinner icing. So let's look at the consistencies. So this is a, this is a soft or a very loose icing. Now, what I would use this for is this would be primarily for flooding. And I'm gonna show you that technique on one of my walls that I created. So this is very loose. This is not the type of icing or the consistency that I would use to go ahead and put a house together, nor would I use it to attach it any pieces to it because it's too wet and it's going to make too much of a mess. Now, this is what I call, call the Goldilocks. It's not too thick. It's not too thin. It's just right. So for this, this is what I'm going to use to attach things. All right. I'm going to use this type of consistency. So how do I get the consistencies? Either add more tannic sugar to tighten it up, or I'm going to add more egg whites to loosen it out. So that's what I'm looking for. And then when I go to go ahead and build it or put it together, I want some semi-stiff icing. So you can see how stiff that is. And that I'm gonna put in my pastry bag and that will help glue and hold things without it just running through. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see with students is not adjusting the icing to the right product of what you're trying to use it for, all right? So Jackie, do we have any questions out there from anybody? We absolutely do. Um, and thank you so, so uh, for everything so far. Everything is um, very, very interesting. So one of the questions, I know that we kind of touched on the humidity as well. Um, and an educator is wondering that if in those cases in living in Florida, if they should use sugar or if isomalt is better for these applications. Isomalt will have the same reaction too um, with the humidity. Um, I would recommend going to the gelatin sheet and the fondant if they want a long, a longevity of the um, piece. Um, and then that will last a lot longer for them. Um, even up here in the drier elements, um, one of my students did a poured sugar window and they're already melting out. And um, that's in Pennsylvania. I can only imagine what it's like in Florida. <laughs> Great, thank you. And another question was, how far in advance can you bake off your gingerbread? Um, that's a plan? great question. I recommend baking it off 
a long time. I'm talking like two, three weeks. You can bake it off ahead of time because what you're trying to do is you're trying to stale the dough. You want the dough to stale and become hard as a brick because that's going to give you your strength. Um, or you can bake it and, and dry it out if you want to do that technique as well. Okay. Yeah. Chef, we talk about um, the curling that happens with the humidity. Oh, with yes. That would be great you, right there. Yes, exactly. One of the things that I would recommend is when, it, when you put the product in the oven and it bakes and right when it comes out, give about five minutes and then flip, flip the piece over because what's going to happen is, is when the piece cools, it's going to want to curl the edges up so that you don't get that warping effect. I always let it, I bake it and then I pull it out and let it sit for about five minutes. I don't flip it right when it's super hot because it's, it's a little too pliable, but I let it set semi and then I flip it and then I let it cool overnight upside down. That helps prevent some of the warping. I don't know if you saw these pieces, you see how straight, straight they are. And that, that's how you get that. So you bake it and then after five minutes, you flip it over onto the sheet pan and then you let it cool like this. Some people like using weights to hold it down. Um, I found that if I just flip it um, after five minutes and then the next day flip it back, it seems to hold it. And if you did get curling, what did you do? Recently? Oh, yes. If you get curling, don't throw it away because if you pop it back in the oven, it'll reconstitute and get soft again and you'll be able to re reshape that back down. So, and one of the things I just learned this year, and that's the thing I want to tell students out there, you know, I've been doing houses several years now, um, and I always learn something new. And there's always new techniques, always new ideas out there. And one of the simplest things was is the roof. You know, by the time you get to the roof, you're talking, on, for me, it's like a week later. And that piece doesn't seem to fit like it, it did in my template. So what I learned to do was, and that was just this year, I put the roof back in the oven, and it became a little semi-pliable. And when I went to attach it, I was able to mold it so it fit much tighter and crisper on my edges when I went to do the roof. And again, a new technique that I learned this just this year. All right. Any other questions, Jackie? Well, there sure are. But I think that's great to underscore that, you know, even though you're uh, obviously very well versed in making gingerbread, that you're always still learning and always still looking for, for new techniques. Yep. Um, and, 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 and if you're not learning, it's time to get out of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> For so, sure. All right. Um, one of the educators has asked, um, when their students are decorating the house, the royal icing seems to slide completely off um, and doesn't adhere to the gingerbread. Is there? Do you have any tips that might resolve that? You're not getting that Goldilocks spot. And the next thing is, if you take a brush, you might have too much flour or tannic sugar on the dough that's been baked. You want to just lightly brush that off with a damp pastry brush. You don't want to get the dough wet, but a damp one, and then it'll stick. Then that it's almost like mortar on a brick. You want to make sure it sticks to that gingerbread. And I always do a buddy system. While the other one person takes the tip and we press in there. You know, we use a lot of um, support when we're building it. We use, um, you know, cornstarch boxes, baking soda boxes, anything we can get our hands on to help hold that thing together. I also recommend when you're building it, I also like to do my walls, um, um, put them together first and then put my roof on like the next day so it has time to dry. All right. So let's talk about some decorating things, okay? Because I know that's what you're really interested in. One of the things that I'd like to talk about is I have three different types of fondant here. So I just take a little piece of each one. I have some gray, some dark gray, and then I have some lighter gray. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to marble this together. So if I'm doing like a stone structure, I like to make stones. One of the things that you have to keep in mind though, if I'm doing a house, let's say this size here, all right, I wanna make sure I make the stones the proper proportionate size to the house that I'm doing. I'll give you an example. If I'm doing a stone, I obviously wouldn't make a stone this big for a house like this, all right? My stone should be more in line with the size of the house. So I will tell you when we get to the, the my, my final show piece that I'm gonna show at the end, just the stones alone took a day, just to make the stones. So I wanna make sure that my young viewers out there, TikTok's great, but TikTok's not reality. Um, it will take you on average, just to do the roof on my turret took me four hours, all right? So that, but you need to make sure that you're Realistic about the time. While TikTok is great and gives you great ideas, 
The reality is, is things take a lot longer because you're at the mercy of things drying and you're at the mercy of, if you want to do things really elaborate, it takes time to do things really pretty, All right? So we talked about doing stones. So that's the, the really cool technique that you can do with stones, all right? The other thing I want to talk about is, let's talk about a cornet. For those that don't know, instead of using pastry bags, I prefer using cornets because what's great is they're disposable and you don't have to wash the bag, you don't have to tip. So this is just a piece of parchment paper. And all I do is I fold it in the center. I roll it up in my hand. One of the cool things that you learn, you know, is word association. You know, when you hear the word cornet, it gets its word from the word cornet or trumpet. That's where it gets its name from. So these little paper cones, you can fill raw icing in there and you go about and decorate. And then when you're done, just throw them away. You don't have anything to clean yeah, up. Just don't overfill them. Yeah, don't overfill them. That's right. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of the tools that you can use. I, like I said, here, here's a very basic set that I picked up, all right? You can use um, poly um, rolling pins, which are really nice. Uh, pastry brushes, scissors, maybe an X-Acto knife. It's nice to have. And when you're doing fond, it's always nice to work on a solid surface, whether it's granite or it's coriander or something like that. All of my tables in my shop are all wood. So I try to stay away from doing fondant on my wooden tables, but I use my granite for that. So let's talk about some different type of techniques of, of dusting. So when I'm doing gingerbread, I'm using flour. When I'm doing fondant, I'm either using cornstarch or I'm using panic sugar. Um, you wanna make sure you do not use flour with fondant, all right? Especially if you're doing a cake, all right? Because if you eat that, you're gonna be eating raw flour with your fondant and you know what flour and water make, they make blue. So it's not, not a good combination. So we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about sifters and, and, and a little taking cornstarch and making a little sachet. So you can do a little dusting. If you want a very fine dusting, this is what I recommend. And this is just no more than some, some, some cheesecloth, put a little tenant sugar in it and I wrap it up in some twine. And then this makes a nice little powder puff and I can dust and I get a much finer dusting than I do from, from that. So if I'm looking for snow to be in relationship to what I'm trying to do, I want to make sure that it's in the right consistency. So this is going to give me a more realistic snow effect than just taking a shaker and dumping a shaker on there, right? So let's talk about fondant because fondant, what we want to do is we got to work ahead. And like I said, prior planning. So in my house, I, I do siding. So I'm going to have paint. So let's talk about this color because this is really important to me. Uh, this year, my house is a trip to my sister um, and for all the ladies out there that are battling breast cancer. So I did my house this year as a tribute to those that are fighting breast cancer. So that's my tribute. So when we get to that, you'll see what I'm talking about. So let's talk about decorating walls. First things first, I do not build my house until I have all my walls decorated, okay? I let I let gravity work with me. So as I'm decorating, I'm going to work down on my items and then work up. After they dry and they're decorated, then I set them up. So I don't go ahead and I build my house and then try to decorate vertical because things are gonna wanna slide and fall off. So that's one of the things that I work on. So let's talk about different techniques. So the first one I did was this, this is doing brick. So this is just cutting out fondant into little brick forms. And then I'm going to go ahead and take an offset spatula, spread some semi-thick icing, not the too thin, not too thick. And then if you spread the whole thing, a thin layer, I put saran wrap over half of it because as I'm working, this icing is gonna wanna set up and dry for me, but I want it to stay tacky. So how do I get that tacky consistency? I keep it covered. And as I'm working, I roll my way back. So this is just making bricks. Now, you can take the embossing tool, and if you want, you can do the embossing tool that has brick and embed that on, and I've seen people do that. I like a more realistic look in doing brick, so I have that yeah. technique. Talk about the laying of your brick, Chef. Yes, when you lay your bricks, and I'm going to, let's jump to the shingles. So this is two different versions. A lot of students forget that when you're constructing, you want to make sure that you try to emulate construction. So this is shingles set on top of each other. That is not how it's done in the real world. Shingles are set up 
staggered because they want the water to shed. And you get a much prettier view and a much prettier image if you're going to go ahead and you're going to stagger those joints, just like you're going to do with the bricks. The bricks are staggered. Now, you can do them in a herringbone form, you can do them in all different types of forms, but you wanna make sure that those joints are staggered and it's gonna give you a more realistic look. So again, this is the look you're looking for. You're not looking for this. And in order to get that, you start with a half. So in here, I would have a half shingle, all right? And then a half shingle, and then it would start with the hole again, all right? So that gives you a nice little uh, technique there. So let's talk about taking it to the next level. So I have brick here, and I don't know if you've ever seen a building where like the stucco, it's stuccoed and it falls, a piece falls off and it gives the illusion that like the bricks behind it. Well, that's what I created here. So I went ahead and I put the brick in and then I took my loose icing and then I flooded it to give this stucco effect, all right? Gives you that really cool stucco effect, all right? And then I'm gonna come back to this because I'm gonna show you how we can enhance that. And then the last two things, we talked about the stones and making a foundation. So that shows you that technique. So I spread icing down and then I went ahead and this would be my foundation. And then I can come over top. And then if I want, I can put my siding then right off of that and build my siding up. And then over here, this is my version that I have here for my siding, right? And that gives you that nice staggered effect. And you really need to make sure that when you're doing siding or anything like that, the ginger, um, sorry, the fauna needs to be dry because if you put it on while it's still wet, every time you push on it, you're going to leave your fingerprints. And if you're not gonna get this nice crisp edge that you want to your siding. Average how much time, Chef? Usually it takes almost a day. So what I like to do is I like to roll it out and then I cut my strips and then I let it sit. And then the next day I come in, I flip each piece over. And then the following day is when I'm able to use them. And then they become pretty, pretty brittle. Almost looks like chewing gum, all right? So that Chef, we did that. we did have a question about that. So um, the side that you just showed with the siding attached, there's obviously some overhang coming off as well. And so a student is wondering how to properly trim that without breaking the rest of the piece. Right. What I do is I trim them for this piece. I didn't trim it to the I trim it to the length. And I'll show you that technique in in the house at the end. But yes, I would have this pre-trimmed. Um, and what's nice is while the siding is still dry it's very easy to cut and to trim it. So it's dry, but it's not completely dry. Now this is about two and a half weeks old. So you can hear it's, it's pretty dry um, and makes it very, very hard to trim. But if you're only talking two days drying, it still will be soft enough that you can trim each piece to, um, to fit, okay? All right, and then the next thing I wanna show you is getting into the details. You know, each, um, I like to always put my houses and I always like to put uh, candles in the window. Um, I was always um, brought up that candles are welcome. It's a symbol of, of you know, the, the light uh, when it comes to Christmas and things like that. So I, I took fondant, I rolled it out. I took a semi uh, soft um, uh, roll icing and then I marbled some yellow, red and orange and created little flames. And those will go inside each of my window then. And that just adds that little extra touch, all right? So let's go on to another thing. So I did a pink lady and that is a Victorian a gingerbread house. So in Victorians, they have a thing called gingerbread. And those are all the scroll work and finial work and the railings and it's all embellished and enhanced and it's more dramatic. So in order to do something like that, you have to use an acetate sheet. So what I have here is, here's a, here's a sampling of my railing that I would create. And this I just hand drew, right? If, you do, if you're not good at hand drawing, you can easily pull from clip art, like railing or gingerbread work, and it will pull up different images for you. Here's another one that I drew out that this one I put across the roof of my house. But then I take that, and here's a little finial work that would go in the E or the peak of my house. All right, so let's go back to our cornet. All right, showed you how that and how we rolled that. So I'm gonna take some of my chocolate. And again, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put a spoonful of chocolate in my cornet. 
Now, when you roll your cornet, there's always this seam. School's in session. Then while you have this seam, you're gonna go ahead and fold your cornet so the seam is facing you. You're gonna roll one side back, the other side back, and then you're gonna roll away from you. So if you roll away, you get a nice tight seam, but if you roll towards, it wants to unravel. So we're gonna go ahead and roll that all up. And then I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm just gonna nip the end, all right? And then I end up with this nice little screen. And then as you can see here, I have my, my acetate sheet and an acetate sheet is just a thick piece of plastic. It usually comes in a roll that looks like this. And then I tape it down. A lot of our students do our ornaments, a run out, which is taking an image, sliding it underneath the acetate sheet, tracing it, and then filling it in and flooding it with chocolate. We do that a lot with our uh, decorations that we put in our pastry shop. So we go ahead and we come in here like so, and we can just draw this out. And all we're doing is we're just tracing. And we just trace this out and we can go ahead and draw our lines in and we can embellish this. And these little enhancements are what we're gonna then add on to. So we just go ahead and, and trace this out and we can come back in and refill. And it gives this pretty little, almost looks like a little heart and we create that over and over. So I wanna go back to this stucco piece because what I like to do is I like to then take it to the next level. And I'm gonna just come in here and I'm just gonna create some, some cracking going on. All right, and maybe I'll come over here with a little fissure and maybe up here a little fissure. All right, and then same way over here, just come in here, just give that little effect like it's cracking. All right, so we took the brick idea, we then flooded it on top of it, and then we took another concept and adding chocolate and flooding it more. If you want, you could do it in white, you could do it in different colors. I made it black so it's a little bit more dramatic, more stands out. So that gives you that look. Of, of stucco or it's crumbling. If that's the look you're looking for, you know, this would be really cool if you're doing like a Western town and you're doing like a, a saloon and, and this might be on the side of it. So it looks kind of neat, a little different effect. So the next thing I want to go on to is Rice Krispie treats because everybody wants to use Rice Krispie treats. And no, we're not going into plumbing, um, but this is one of the things that we use. Um, if I'm doing a barn or anything with a silo or a tower or a castle, this is what I'm going to use. So I use a combination of PVC pipes. So luckily in my school, we have a plumbing department and he always has these odds and then pieces that haven't been used. Um, and I go ahead and then spray this with um, some nonstick grease, whether it's Pam or whatever you use. And then the reason why I don't buy them pre-bought is because there is preservatives in there that help prevent it from stale. And I want this to stale. I want this tower to become hard. So when I make my Rice Krispie treats, I kind of adjust the recipe a little bit. And when I cook and melt the marshmallows and the butter, I cook it a little harder so it becomes a little crispier. And I add a little bit more Rice Krispie treats so I have less of the marshmallow and more of the crispy. And then I'll go ahead and I will pack this tube completely full with Rice Krispies, let it cool, and then I will take another plunger or a, a, a rolling pin and I will push this out and I will end up with an entire cylinder of Rice Krispie treats. You can do a smaller one if you want. This one is the one I use normally for if I do a castle or if I'm going to do a barn. This gives a really nice silo. So how do you do the top? Very simply, I take a funnel and I have funnels that fit for each one of these, Oops, sorry. And then I have one for this one over here. And then all I do is again, spray the inside. I pack the funnel and then it gives me this beautiful cone shape that will then be able to be put on top of my house and gives you that really cool effect. Now to finish it out, I go back to my fondant and I have different sizes. So for the roof of the turret, I'm gonna use these smaller little um, cutouts. And how I cut these out, these are no more than rolling the fondant very, very thin. So when you're doing shingles or roof or siding, the fondant needs to be thin because they're gonna be stacked on top of it. And if you have it thick, 
they won't then um, it'll it'll be too heavy on the top of the roof. It won't look as realistic as it should. So they need to be thin. So these were cut out with a large straight tip. So I took a pastry tip and I just cut them out. That's how I got this nice round disc. And this was a larger um, pastry tip that I just cut these out as well. So it ends up with that. So using that staggered technique, I end up with that nice little look. So let's talk about some other things. If I wanna do porches and I wanna do any type of um, something to hold up a roof, take your gingerbread, you roll it, and you bake it, and right when it comes out, you roll it again so you have a nice cylinder. Then I wrap it with fondant, and then this becomes nice and hard, and this is sturdy enough that it will then hold up the porch. I also took a little bit of the pink fondant, and I put strips on it so it has a little decorative edge, okay? Chef, can you use pretzels in that? You can use pretzels. I find, for me, the pretzels are a little bit too thick. It's, it's there. the pretzel sticks are too thin, and the pretzel logs are, are too thick. So I end up making my own. So that's what I usually end up doing. So last thing I wanna talk about here is the board. Um, we use here just regular cardboard, but if you're doing a piece that's going into um, a competition, I would recommend uh, getting a board made so that it fits um, right to the size of exactly what you're doing. Um, it's not just about the house. Um, a lot of people do not just the house, but they also incorporate the yard, and trees and things like that. In my situation, the house that I did was, I just ended up doing just the house and my focus was on the house. So with that being said, I'd like to go over here and show you my house that I ended up doing. Uh, and this is my tribute to all those that are fighting breast cancer. So this is the pink lady. So let's talk about some of the applications and some of the things that we talked about in my previous demo that I walked through and how we then applied that to here. So we have our torrent here, and you can see that is, gin, that is not gingerbread, that is uh, Rice Krispie Treats. And then I then encased it with a gray icing first to get it smooth, and then I put the shingles on top of each one of them. That roof alone took me four hours. So I tried to stagger the joints as best as I could, and I worked my way around. And then you can see here, I used um, a little bit of that same technique of on the roof here. I did it in a different color as a little accent. Then we're talking about the stones. Here's the stones. This entire tower here is made out of Rice Krispie Treats. But let's talk about how that tower, I first did it. I wrapped the entire tower yellow first, and then I covered over the yellow and exposed just the windows with, with the stone. So the stone work is all covering up the yellow, but I left the windows open to give that a, a exposure. Each window I went and framed out white to give it that neat crisp edge. And then I came in with a cornet, like I showed you with raw icing. And I did all this little embellishing work all around, whether it's on the side or it's in the front. When we get to the candles, I cut the candles down according to the size of the window. I've added in some royal icing that I've colored. So whenever you're coloring royal icing and you add color to it, you're adding liquid. So that means you have to add more tannic sugar to tighten it up for when you're adding liquid to it, okay? Now to do the icicles, very simply, a, sim a semi-soft semi icing, I build up a lot and then I come downward and I pull. And as I'm pulling, I pull away and it ends up leaving this nice hanging icicle edge to it. That all comes from the right consistency of icing, okay? And there are some times I want the white to show, and then there are some times I don't. So like, let's look over here. So like all the beadwork up here, I made gray to make it match, match the, um, the, uh, the shingles. And then I did the same here. And then here's that raw, that chocolate work I did it across the top here and that gives you that illusion to do the uh, wreaths again if you're working with the walls down what's nice about that is is you then end up getting to have gravity work with you some people like to make the wreaths separate and then attach them i like to build the wreath right on the house and then there's one over here a larger one over here that you can see that as well and then we can turn this around and we can show you that is completely decorated all the way around, okay? And then we can spin it around this way. And then you can see this one. All right, and that gives you a full look. 
then you can see the chocolate work up in here, that gingerbread work all done in chocolate as well. So what's nice is if you have that pastry bag skill and you work with your cornets, you can apply those basic principles of bead work and things like that onto your house. Jackie, is there any questions that anybody has out there for me? Yes, Chef. And I mean, it's just absolutely spectacular. What a work of art, my goodness. Uh, but we did have a question about some certain products too. Um, some of the students were wondering if you ever cover your houses with confectioner's glaze spray or use ginger clay. I, I do not use ginger clay. I know that there are a lot of um, artists out there that do. Um, I'm not opposed to it. Um, I haven't um, played around with it enough. I know that is kind of like the hot trend, everybody using ginger clay. And, and um, I just, I personally don't use it. I try to stay away from glitters and, and any type of spray like that only because I, I'm trying to, to make it as um, edible as possible. Um, some of those sprays and glitter that you use. You can use, and I have in the past used uh, glitter dust and, and um, um, things like that, but I kind of stay with the more neutrals, um, like the sleigh and the skates and stuff are all fond of, yeah. you know, just rolled out like so. But I'm not opposed to it. You can certainly play around with it. Sure, thank you. And for assembly, do you recommend just assembling with the royal icing or do you put together sort of the bones of your structure using a, a boiled sugar? I don't, I don't use sugar again for that same reason. Um, I know a lot of people like to dip it in the boiled sugar and then glue it together because it, it, it's, it's seals together really quick. But again, if you're in a humid area, sugar is a no, no, it won't last for a long period of time. Now, if you're just doing it and then you're going to use it for that week and then throw it away, great. You can certainly use the sugar, but in this situation, what's amazing is, is this house in this structure, the way I created it. I can keep this up for two years. So while you don't want to eat it, but I can still keep this up to two years. I had a, 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 a big house that was four stories and that was Gastos from Ratatouille. And that lasted two years. The only wow. thing it did was is it faded. It, it, obviously it was in sunlight, so the fondant has faded out. But um, if you build it like this, I can get more more time in it. And that's why I want to do it that way because yeah. I want to get the light. Speaking out. of that fading, Chef, talk about buying pre-colored to mixing. Yeah. yeah. If you buy the pre-colored fondant, you're going to have a longer shelf life of color where if you make it yourself, that seems like I've noticed that the coloring fades out. Uh, there are people that like to make the fondant and make their own fondant. I buy it commercially, um, support those other companies out there. Um, all of my chocolate, I use Spelchin. Um, I like their melts. Um, they melt really nice. Um, great customer service as well. No plug for Felchin, but um, yeah, it works out really nice um, on, on their product. I don't have to worry about tempering. For this application, um, I just use the melts because it's really easy. Um, um, and then you just want to make sure when you're melting chocolate, I always melt on the water bath. I stay away from um, microwaves just because it gets too hot for me. Um, on a nice water bath, low and slow and, and just take it. And then you end up with, with the chocolate when it casts and cools, it becomes really, really shiny. Wonderful. And the students are wondering too, if you might be able to walk through how you attach that deck. The deck. Okay, sure. So what I did was when I, when I built the house first, so it didn't have a porch, the, just like in construction, I started with the bottom and I had a little skinny piece of gingerbread that I put stones on it and that's underneath here. And then in underneath this floor, I have little pieces of gingerbread about this big standing upright that go all the way down this whole, whole run of the porch. Now, if you see this technique I use, this is the grooved gingerbread like I showed you in the demonstration. I then apply that on top. So I start with the porch. Here's my gingerbread rolls that I showed you that I then wrapped in fondant. So then I go ahead and I start from the outside and I do this corner and this corner, and then I attach it. Now underneath, I don't think you'll be able to see it, but I put an extra band of, of siding down and that is actually on the side. So it catches the roof. So it's actually sitting on that strip. Now that strip was applied when it was down vertical. 
So that is hard. So when I go ahead and put the porch on it, I attach these two and then I slide in the rest of the pillars for that. Yeah. What's the blue roof for, Chef? Oh, for those that don't know, <laughs> um, this, the blue in the porch is the Victorians always painted their porch roofs blue to discourage birds from nesting in their porches. So that is a classic um, touch that I added in there because the birds would fly into the porch, think it's open sky, and then they would fly on their way and they wouldn't nest and make a mess on their porches. So that's why it's blue underneath there. <laughs> the things you learn, amazing. Um, so I know that many of the students are writing in, they're going to be attempting to produce their first ever gingerbread house this month. Awesome. And um, we obviously can tell by everything they explained today that mise en place is obviously really important and, and not rushing and pre-planning. What, what might be your top tips to those students who are about to embark on their first ever gingerbread project? Yeah, well, you know the word mise en place. So it's, it's my biggest thing is come up with a great idea. Because if you come up with a great idea, the hours that you put into it don't matter because you love it and you chose it. So that's the beautiful thing about our profession. It's something you chose to do. So like my father said, you never work a day in your life if you, if you chose to do something. Um, so find something that inspires you and then take that and put that into the cardboard and make as accurate of a template as you can. Also use those techniques that I told you, consistency of rolling out, Every step in the process matters, every step. There's not one step that isn't important. So it comes from rolling it out evenly, from cutting it out evenly, baking it correctly, decorating it as crisp and as clean as you can, because all those little things along the way all create a snowball effect, either positively or negatively. So you wanna make sure that you're going down that positive train because when you're done and you step back, you end up with something like this. And practice, practice, practice. Because my first one didn't look anything like this. And you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. Really great advice. And while you're at it, I'm wondering if you might be able to tell those who are tuning in a little bit about your program. Um, some of sure. them might be thinking about implementing a pastry program at their schools. And so we'd love to hear more about yours. Absolutely, Jackie, thank you so much. And that's what I love. Um, you and I have been working at this very um, tirelessly. Um, I was the first high school baking program to be ACF accredited, but I am also a Pro Start school as well. So Bob and I also have a Pro Start. Well, Pro Start doesn't have much in baking, but we do have our cake decorating competition, which I'm excited about. Um, I use the curriculum from Pro Start, which is fantastic. And then I just enhance it with the baking books that I need to fill in the required knowledge and competencies. And that's the great thing with ProStart and ACF. I got the best of both worlds and opportunities for our students. So it's not one or the other, it's both if you really wanna maximize the opportunities for your student. The other thing we also have here is we have an apprenticeship program. So we have our high school program, but we also have a college program and we have an apprenticeship program with the Hotel Hershey, the Hershey Lodge and Convention Center. And those students come to us on a Monday and we do the related technical uh, training with them. And that's a 4,000 hour. And just recently, we just had our um, secondary program recognized by this, the DOL in Pennsylvania as a pre-apprenticeship program. So it's always, you know, 27 years, Bob and I have been here teaching. It's always opportunities. Um, and I can encourage the educators out there, if they're ever interested in anything that Bob and I can do to help you if you're interested in accreditation, if you're interested in ProStart, um, we, we've in, taken the entire ProStart curriculum and we've created lessons and things like that from it. And it's just such a great curriculum um, to use and integrate. And it works so well with the ACF um, required knowledge and competency. Wonderful. Well, um, let me see. We will then go to our question, which is um, some of the students are wondering if you might have any advice for aspiring bakers and pastry students who are now looking to enter the industry in the next couple of years. Well, they pick the best time to enter because they have tons of resources. You know, Bob and I were talking, we we're kidding. When we were learning how to learn our trade, we'd have to go to this place called a library. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> And you have to go and try to find that one ice carving book. And every time we seem to go to the library, that ice carving book was checked out. Well, now our students today have everything 
in the, in the palm of their hands. They can watch masters from all over the world doing wonderful, amazing things. And it's just a matter of taking that knowledge and then applying it and honing their craft and their skills. It is truly endless opportunities. And the living wage for our industry is going up and up and up and up. While we've seen some dramatic um, impacts of COVID and the pandemic, what we have seen in our area is the um, wages have gone up tremendously. So I'm really, really excited about that. And I think people are not taking our industry for granted anymore and really appreciate going out to eat and enjoying uh, fine dining and enjoying our great pastries and our great food. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. And Chef, do you have any final words that you'd like to say as we uh, move towards the end of our presentation today? Well, I just want to thank everybody who attended today. I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak, Jackie. And I really just wish everybody out there a very happy holiday and a safe one. Enjoy yourself. And I'd love to see any of your creations. Feel free to um, email me. You can find my email on the ACF website. Feel free to email me any pictures. And if you have any questions or concerns, email me. I'd be more than happy to help you through those little hiccups or hurdles that you come in contact with. Well, thank you so much, Chef. I mean, you're just a, a true artisan. And I know that now I'm even more ready for the holidays after seeing um, all of your great um, tips and creations when it comes to gingerbread. So thank you. And a huge virtual round of applause as we all thank Chef Brian Peffley. Uh, My we pleasure. Thank you. We, we absolutely appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your skills and enthusiasm for the pastry craft with the students and, and culinary professionals tuning in today, especially during this busy time. So I hope everyone who's tuning in is now thinking about how they can step up their gingerbread house game or centerpieces this year. And ACF members, let's continue the conversation on the chef's table. So be sure to log into the ACF website. Please be on the lookout for a survey that you will receive today or tomorrow if you'd like to earn your one hour of ACF CEH. We will also be including chef's recipes and also the recording of today's presentation. We hope that you'll also join us for a special upcoming presentation we have this Saturday, December 10th, as we'll dis discuss a recipe for success for young and aspiring culinarians with ACF National President and our ACF Young Chefs Club president. They'll also be joined by some special guests so that we can get you some information on goal setting and how you can make a difference in your early career. Don't forget, we're heading to the Big Easy and you're all invited. Please save the date or register today for ACF National Convention, which will be in New Orleans, July 16th through the 19th. And we will also be having an educator summit for culinary educators on July 15th. So save that date, more info coming soon. On behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to New Hampshire and Massachusetts Coast Start. Thanks, of course, to our amazing guest chef, Brian Pepley. And uh, again, we can't thank you enough for bringing us this delicious and very inspiring opportunity to learn more about gingerbread and gingerbread skills. So happy holidays to everyone, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.